And good morning. This is an extremely rare morning stream from me. Uh, I did a whole lot of refactoring. I had a whole bunch of code in various bits and bobs that I'd worked on were in the Go scripts. And that's no good because if you've got something in a Go script, you can't use it in a different mission. So, started pulling those out and realized what I needed was a save where I could pop into the save and have a ship on orbit that I could trigger bits of code from. So that was a couple of things. I needed a ship beefy enough to be on orbit with sufficient delta V that I could try things like um, intercepting Minmus or leaving the, the SOI or changing my uh, inclination radically. I built it up called it Justly Cluttered Hall, and it's my development workhorse. I've got the main Go script for it on the screen. And you'll notice I've got a bunch of calls to add task. What I want to be able to do is have a GUI panel laid out vertically that has a bunch of radio buttons on it, or a bunch of checkboxes, and you, you click on one and you go do that task, and then it turns it off when the task is done. And so I got to messing with the GUI, okay. Um, got to messing with what the concept of a task was, and I took what I've been using for background tasks and for phases where a positive value, you return a positive value, you say, call me again in this long, or a zero saying, go on immediately to the next step, or a negative value saying, delay for a while, go on to the next step. Um, you could do the same thing with the task. So a task is gonna be a simple little bit of code that executes and does something simple and returns either a zero for I'm done or a positive value for call me back in this long. And so in theory, a task could be something like the existing circularize code, which we call here. And this would normally be a, a, a phase, but this means that I can trigger this task and you know, from the screen, have it go do the circularization, and then come back, and we're still available, so I can do that. Uh, I added a task for execute node, because we, we worked out how to execute maneuver nodes properly. Uh, maneuver step, right there, boom. And we had code for doing things like um, matching the inclination of a target which could be Kerbal I wanted to, to rescue, or it could be a body I want to go to. More on that later. We haven't refined that concept. Right now, if we try to intercept, whoops, inclination, well, the inclination is perfect. If we try to plan an intercept to a body, <coughs> we'll do the Holman that in the absence of the gravity at the body would intersect the body. So with the gravity at the body, this means that we will end up in their SOI um, on some orbit that comes really close. And this means that when I do a planned intercept to a, you know, a body with gravity, there's going to be more things we have to do. But apropos rescues and, and uh, rendezvous, we've got a planned correction. So all of these have some things we do. Um, we're going to say add task and it's going to add a line to our GUI. We're going to have a condition that has to be true for us to work. So match inclination. We can only match inclination if we have a target. And then there's going to be a delegate that will execute when we start the task. So if we were doing something else and we start doing match inclination, the first thing we do is this mission export target. Um, there was a whole bunch of, of work done in the rescue thing. Uh, during boot time, you're you're picking out which target you want to go to, and if you if you have one persisted, you use it. If you don't, you look at target, and if you find a target, you then have to persist a bunch of variables. Mission export target was the part of that that took whatever you had targeted and persisted data about it, so that things like the the match code could could match um, that target. So we've got 
stuff to do before. We have the actual thing. Now I could um, write this as phage match inkle at rather than having this whole long function, but the syntax for passing a delegate to a function differs from the syntax to pass something where the 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 identifier is a delegate. And frankly, this code should not care whether phage match inkle is a actual function or if it's a delegate. So I'm going to write code that actually calls it and return that delegate. Um, I could simply go back to phase match and say, oh, these are all going to be delegates so they can be modified. But for now, this code is just going to be written this way. Also, having some of these be actual inline delegates and some of them be go call that guy out there with at um, looks odd. So for now, I'm just bracketing them up. Um, also, the no op that I'm using here, uh, there is a special delegate called do nothing, which the type of that is no delegate, and it is a delegate, but you can't call it. So if I were going to allow add task to be passed to do nothing, it would internally have to check and see if there was a, you know, if the thing was do nothing or not, and then it would have to call it if it's a delegate and not call it if it's a do nothing. Well, it's easier for me just to pass in this no op, which is just open close curly brace. It's a it's a inline anonymous function that returns having returns nothing having done nothing. So that's our add task. Now, how does how does that work? That's new code. Um, let's go over quickly the rest of these. These were pulled out. So mission target got. Oh come on. Control K. Control J. There. Mission target got the code that we had in rescue that did all this stuff with uh, if we've got a mission target and it's not in the list, then clear it. And mission new target says wait until we have a target and keep reminding the engineer. So this will this function actually sits here and blocks until we've got a target, which is what we wanted to do in rescue. Mission export target says we've got a target. So we create some global variables and we persist things like its name and some of the information about its orbit. Uh, this is the information that you get from a simple uh, put a put a satellite in an orbit. This is where this came from, uh, where it tells you I want the satellite in an orbit. Here's the periapsis. Here's the apoapsis. Here's the inclination and here's the longitude of the ascending node. Um, I have since seen contracts that specify the argument of the periapsis. These are, uh, I think the rescue car contracts do this. Uh, I saw an adjust orbit macro, uh, adjust orbit contract. I think that had argument of periapsis. So at some point we may add more match stuff in here, um, or we may modify match so that we have a, just a global variable called match target that has a uh, match orbit that has the whole thing. Uh, or maybe we'll modify match to use mission orbit. And pick target was the total logic that we used at the beginning of the rescue, which says it's invalid, drop it. If it's there, then set target to it and assume the rest of it's, well, don't assume the rest of it's persisted. If we have mission target set, then set target to it. Otherwise, wait and do it. So that's the old mission target code. Uh, predict. I don't think predict got much of a change. Um, it is encapsulating a couple of interesting bits of knowledge about the API. Uh, position at is very, very useful, but it returns the vector uh, in a coordinate system that is centered on the current location of the ship. And I want to get it, I generally want position vectors to be from the body that a vessel is orbiting to the vessel. Okay, so we take position at, we subtract body position from it, and that adjusts the the vector to be the actual vector from body to target. Velocity uh, is relative to current ship position, but that's all locked down. It turns out that the well, let's see, rewind velocity at returns your velocity relative to the body, but it returns one of these big structures that has an orbit and a surface component. 
So we want to get the orbit. So this gets us the velocity vector relative to the body. So position at relative to the vessel, velocity at relative to the body. You see why I encapsulated this? Because I even going and looking at this code, I still will get tongue-tied on which one it is. Um, and then I had some logic for predicting a position error. So we predict where the ship is going to be and where the object is going to be at the time given and we return the magnitude of that vector. So this is something we did a lot of. If it turns out that we want the the actual vector error at some point, I will bust this in two pieces and we'll get back the vector error. Uh, intercept um, accumulated the code that used to live in the rescue mission where we had one step that was plan the burn, plan the maneuver, which takes us from our current orbit down to or up to the orbit of the target vessel, arriving there when the target vessel is there. Uh, and this morning in the shower, I thought, wait a minute, I could make it so if my orbit is close enough to the target, if I'm in the same orbit as the target already, I'm just wrong phase, I can do plan intercept to move me into a eccentric orbit that comes back around and meets up with where I am uh, at, a, at a time that closely matches the target. But that assumes I'm really in the same orbit because you're not going to be switching orbits there. Um, going beyond that, um, trying to make intercept completely general. Uh, at that point you start looking at pork chop plots and Lambert solvers and things get really big and complex and what I wanted to do was keep these at least reasonably simple but by simple you see this line this is this function is 90 lines long already so calling this simple it's conceptually not hard to think about what it does but it is a lot of lines of code so I did not want to start working on a Lambert solver which I um, am assuming is going to be many times larger so uh, We've gone over this code during the rescue mission. Um, I think I may have made a, a bit of a change. Uh, there was some code in here that said, create a list of uh, burn steps, and then I call hill climb seek for each burn step. I was doing that all over the place. So I thought, why not extend the hill climb package to have a seeks? So not just seek, singular, but seeks, plural. It takes a list of burn steps. It just does a seek for each of those burn steps and returns the result. Uh, I'm not going to show that. That's, um, I think that's simple enough. No, let's go ahead and show it. Da, 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 maneuver .ks. No, it's not maneuver.ks. I am sorry. This is hill climb. Okay, mostly Kevin's work here. Um, and I didn't do my normal fold this stuff up. This is only one statement. It does not require braces. There we go. So seeks basically just says for each step and step size and step size list, set data to seek of data and return data. Um, I considered extending this. Now, I believe, and I've checked on Reddit with the developers, that this construct should evaluate the fitness function with next data, then evaluate this fitness function with data. So when we return a vector, oh, no, the vector we return will not necessarily be the last one we evaluated. So there's that. Okay, so I did not correct that. I did not make that. It, it, so we're, we will have the last one we we um, evaluated will have been the original neighbor. So we're only going to have evaluated the the final return value if we didn't make any progress. Oh, wait a minute. This isn't to return next data. So that does work. Okay, so as we're looping here, I'll... Um, we get the next neighbor, we evaluate the best neighbor, we evaluate the original vector, and if the original, if the, if the uh, neighbor is not better, if we don't, if we don't get approval, we return the original, which we have just evaluated. So, rewind. 
I am asserting that because of order of operation, when seek returns, the last call to fitness function will have been the data vector that we return. So if the fitness function includes side effects like configuring a maneuver node, then we know that that maneuver node is configured for the vector that the seek function returns. Yay! Got it out there. So that's hill climb. That's the latest change I made to that. Um, I believe maneuver has been largely unmodified. The last thing I did there was to break out the uh, VE and so on, and then invert the whole thing into being maneuver step. So, uh, yeah, here's maneuver step. Oh, there was one adjustment I had to make. Uh, in maneuver time, maneuver time was bailing out because there was something weird going on uh, in VE. So, exhaust velocity, we're having problems. If we were in the middle of staging and there was no available thrust, then the computation of the exhaust velocity did it divide by zero. So here I'm returning zero. What I'm noticing here is I've goofed again. No, I haven't. There it is. Here's the computation of our maneuver time, and I am wrapping it up to protect it. I'm saying choose the expression if VE is positive. So if we don't have any available thrust, so if the numerator, if the Yeah, this will, this will have problems if I have an engine that has a zero ISP. I don't think ISP ever changes. But if we do this loop and we have no available thrust, uh, then denominator and numerator are both going to be zero, so we choose zero. And here, VE is going to be, is not going to be positive, so we're going to return zero. So we had to adjust these to protect ourselves against the case where we are staging and we have no thrust available. What is the maneuver time if you have a delta V that you want and you have no engines? Well, I'm going to return zero here. Um, because there is no maneuver that makes anything better. It's kind of arbitrary. So... How do we get to that? Oh, we got to that because I said, well, as long as I'm looking at changes I've made. So there, that's there. Intercept broke down into planning and intercept. That leaves us maneuver nodes. So now we go to the mission package, well, not mission, the maneuver package, and we execute the node. And we come back here and we plan a correction. And largely unchanged. Uh, I have considered, when you're doing corrections, this plan was really great for when I was rescuing a Kerbal in an orbit close to mine, so my transfer orbit was not very eccentric. And I picked a correction time that was halfway between, you know, when I got into the home orbit and when I came out, I chose half of the time. Half of the time is not half of the distance, so... Uh, what I originally was envisioning was we've got an elliptical orbit, upper half of an elliptical orbit. And what I want to do is burn at this halfway point where we are, you know, we, we burned here pointing this way. I want to get us turned 90 degrees and burn pointing that way. Well, finding that point, uh, I don't think that's closed form calculation. I think that's a iteration, iteration. But here's the thing small errors in where you burn for the correction have even smaller effects on the burn. So even an approximate solution is good. Half of the time, unfortunately, if this is a highly eccentric orbit, let's say you're here around Kerbin like this, and you are burning to go out to Minmus. Well, half of the time gets you out to like here. <laughs> so that got me scratching and thinking, well, when's the best time to do a correction? Well, if you do the correction too soon, then small errors in your burn 
end up being larger errors at the destination, which means you have you know you, your your burn was you know not as good as it could have been. And if you do it too late, then it takes a lot of delta v to correct a smaller error. So somewhere in the middle is your best point, but that's going to depend on how big your error is. So as we're moving into a more general scheme, um, the correction plan burn. Uh, we're going to start manipulating the transfer core, uh, the expert core time, so the correction time of the burn. Um, the other thing is that my correction burn may change the time of closest approach. And I have resisted this. I've said, well, let's do a correction burn that gets us as close as we can at expert final time. Now, I'm pretty sure that whatever we do to minimize that, we will end up with, in the final stages of our orbit, uh, we will end up on a velocity vector that leads through the target. Because if we're off to one side, no matter how far towards us or beyond us we go, we could adjust it radially and laterally to get closer, right up until the locus of places we can reach, you know, given that we're, we're saying at that time, uh, I think the perpendicular there lies along our velocity vector. So this nailing our time to the wall here is probably not a bad idea. Uh, I didn't see any support inside KOS for saying, please find me the time at which this orbit is closest to that thing. Uh, you pretty much have to iterate on it. Now, we can write that iterator. That's simple enough. I mean, I could even use hill climb to do that. And you just hill climb the time around until it's minimized it as well. Um, so we would we would do another hill climb, time, you know, minimizing the uh, minimizing the error based on extra final time. Uh, we're doing a, whole, a lot of iterative solutions here, but it's a Kepler orbit. We're going to be doing iterative solutions. I give up. I'll do I'll do the direct math when I can, but we're just going to have to accept the iterative solutions. And I may end up doing iterative solutions when the math just gets too frippin' hairy. Uh, like I said, uh, I keep talking about Lambert solvers. Um, it may be the Lambert solvers and pork chop plots are just a way of basically doing iteration. Lamp the pork chop plots are just uh, evaluating the cost function at a range of starting times and and so on. So range of starting times and end times and boom 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 you figure out the pork chop plot there and and there you go. Um, so really at that point you end up with a surface that you're going to do a gradient descent on or a, uh, or a hill climb step. So we're back to hill climbing again. Anyway there's intercept. So we pulled intercept out. Uh, rendezvous is similar. Uh, we had during rescue, we had a course approach. We had logic built into the go script, which I've pulled out that says things like, uh, gosh, it's not time yet. We're not there yet. Uh, course approaches. We're going to be just coasting on in for a long time. And we've got to warp to, uh, I need to, verify whether we have to set our warp mode explicitly or not. I know sometimes I'll be watching a mission and it will be warping. We're moving really slowly and I'll reach up and it'll be in physical warp at 4x rather than in rails warp at 50x. So warp 2. Um, we want our, our steering to be retrograde, yada yada. It's the whole thing of breaking us down to, to stop just short of the target vessel uh, on this plane perpendicular to our velocity. So yeah, we, we've gone over that code. And the fine approach, again, is just thrusting to get ourselves going towards the target and then slowing down and slowing down and slowing down. Uh, at some point, because we've opened up RCS jets, uh, I will be doing a approach for docking that's going to require use of RCS jets. So we need to Make sure our docking port is facing their docking port and then use the RCS jets to move left and right and up and down and control our velocity towards the docking. So the docking script is going to be um, interesting. And I'm not sure how fine control I have over the RCS jets, 
uh, they do have a minute. If you try to thrust it under 10%, the jet's cut off. Now, if I need just a tiny amount of thrust, there's two things you could do. You can you can burn them at their 10% for you know like 100. You just like one fizz one fizz tick at 10% and off, and boop, just boop boop like that. Uh, and see if you can get the correction that way. Uh, the other way, I think, is if I can fire RCS jets in opposing directions. If I fire one at 10% and one at 11%, I'll get a net 1%, but that does cost us fuel as if we're burning at 21%. So there'll be some experimentation there. So Rendezvous will start growing RCS-based stuff. But we've already gone over this code as well. Um, it's a distant cousin to the falling distance problem. Uh, I believe I did not copy the big old comment about solving for this stuff. I may have to recover a comment that discusses the formula used. Anyway, so all this stuff got broken out. Um, also, we could do... Where'd it go? Let me bring up just the mission plan for Cluttered Hall. So we could do this. Now Cluttered Hall is going to just have a normal uh, go to orbit and come back kind of a script. So countdown, launch, set, go circularize. Normal, normal launch phases. Then down at the end when we're done, we deorbit, fall, decelerate, parachute, save, shoot, gear, land, park. Now I just pulled this directly out of prior missions. So, beginning to form a library of clusters of phases. So, this almost might be called a LEO or KEO uh, phase and a uh, Kerbal landing phase. So, maybe an inside mission will have some stock phases we export. But, all that's important here is that the hall, just the cluttered hall, We'll do this task step. And task step. Haven't done anything in the task yet. Task step does the following. We pick a task. So we have somewhere we have a collection of tasks that we might want to run. And we pick one. And that'll be one that the user has turned on that their firing condition is on, and it'll say, okay, we're good to go. So boom, pick a task. Uh, we have a notion of what our current task is. So if we're changing tasks, we call the stop method on the old task, and we print something to the, the text console because I'm still printing in the text console. And then we switch to the new task and start it. And then we come out of that and we have a task we're running, so we call step. Now, if there's no task to run, there is a null task. And the null task is always ready to run and it always returns, call me again in a second. So when we're doing nothing, we're going to come back here. We're going to run task step every second, so looking for the user to turn on a task that is enabled. And if a task ever, you know, if the task step doesn't return a positive number, we're going to unpress the button and return. Simple, 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 simple. OK, so task pick. We have a list of tasks. And we say, look through the task list. And if the task is pressed, return it. Well, what I'm going to do here is I'm not going to unpress it. I'm just going to say, if task pressed and t colon colon return t. Yeah, I was just thinking about this. and. If the user enables a task whose condition isn't ready or not, my old logic would turn it off. Instead, I should leave it on until the condition is satisfied. So the user turning it on says, do this task as soon as its condition is OK. So let's say we've got a task whose condition is, uh, I am in the mun I'm in the SOI of the MUN. So I can turn that on during transit, and it will happily sit there enabled until I transition to, to MUN's SOI and then it will fire. That's what I want. So this becomes there. That looks readable. If the button is pressed and the condition passes, 
then return team. We only call the condition if the button is pressed. So condition may do other, condition may have side effects. Condition is handed to us. Okay, so now we need something to set up this task list so it has suffixes like pressed and conned and start and stop and text and step and so on. Well, here it is. Here's add task. So add task is passed in. This is something that your mission calls. You pass it in text to put next to the button. And then four function delegates. The, the condition delegate, start delegate, stop delegate, and step delegate. We create a thing we call the task, which is going to be a lexicon. You can't create custom types. But you can create a lexicon and you use the suffix notation to look up something lexicon that looks a whole lot like calling a suffix function of a class. The only downside is, you know, you can't can't really do a class because, you know, your your lexicon is per object. So yeah, no inheritance, yada yada. Um, anyway, so this this isn't a user structure, quote unquote, but it's good enough. And once we have this task, I can add methods for pressed and unpressed because add task is going to create a checkbox on a GUI panel. And now we're going to hook up pressed and unpressed to, well, determine if the checkbox is button is pressed. And unpressed says, turn it off. So we've got those methods. Bada boom, bada bing. So the only time we're going to unpress it now is when the task is completed or aborted. Uh, notice that if we... Oh, almost forgot. If I change tasks, do I want to do that? No, no, let's not do that. Um, we're only doing one task at a time. So there's this idea that we're going to scan the task list each time to find the best task to run. Well, if there's several tasks that are enabled, we're going to run the first one. What I just did was I thought maybe I should, you know, if we switch tasks, maybe I should disable the old task. And no, I should leave the old task enabled. I'll call it stop thing because we're going to do something else for a while. Unless something else is done, we're going to go back and call it start and do it again. We'll continue it. Okay, so there's add task. Now what about the null task? Uh, null task is real simple. It's a, we call new task to create it. And it's got a, <laughs> I did a whole bunch of things here that I didn't end up using anywhere but this. So let's let's just get rid of those. Uh, oh, come on, Greg. Type well. Return true. So the idle task, the condition is true, the start is nothing, the stop is nothing, and... Um, this forces us into the selfie pose when we're idle. Not a bad idea, but I think based on not knowing whether phase pose is a function or a delegate, I'm going to return phase pose like that. And that means I believe I don't need those. Um, now pressed gets returned true and unpressed gets a no op. These should no longer be used. There we go. So I was fiddling around with using delegate bindings to get delegates that uh, were delegates to function return true, zero, and one, and so on. Um, not needed. Yagni. And for new task, as I said, this is just a lexicon. So we initialize the lexicon to have those fields of those values. Now, during creation, we are adding checkboxes to a task panel. So here's where I hook into the KOS GUI. And this is, this is new since I last used KOS, which was years ago. We have a GUI. We can draw a GUI on the panel. We don't have to use the terminal. Yay! And I've checked, uh, when you put up a GUI panel and you switch to the map view, it's still there. 
So when I started this, I was using action groups. So I would like hit the three button. That only works from the flight view. From the map view, if you hit three on the map view, it doesn't do action group three. But if you have a GUI up there with a checkbox, you can still hit the checkbox in the map view. So yay. So I'm starting out with a GUI panel. I'm saying 500 wide and as long as necessary. Uh, I'm not sure what happens if I put zero in here. Um, hey, let's do the next test run with that set to build a GUI that is completely dynamic sized. So we're going to let the GUI do its layout and stretch itself to fit whatever it is. And we may have to go back in here and poke a width in. I don't know. Uh, text panel is the yeah, we add V layout, so when we start adding these to the panel, they're going to work downward. So in theory, we could add something to that panel, which is a horizontal layout, so we could add a horizontal thing that has a checkbox, a text box, an option, and an option, and an option, if we wanted to. But for now, we're just going to leave that alone. Um, that's for future. We'll have to work out how to add tasks that has parameters. Uh, and we're going to track whether the GUI is showing or not, and we don't do that anymore because that, that wasn't actually working. I was doing something where uh, we would automatically attempt to show the GUI if it wasn't showing. I never did get that code working. So now the mission code just makes sure that it shows the GUI when it comes time to do it. So we come in here, we create the panel, we create, you know, we create the GUI in the panel. Uh, we've defined the functions. The mission is going to go off and add a whole bunch of tasks, and what's all done, it'll call task GUI show, and that will put the GUI up on the screen. And I'm hoping it doesn't do any of the layout until that point, so it can get the size right the first time. What I don't want to see is I don't want the panel showing up really small, and then jittering around and expanding and contracting and jittering around until it finally gets to the right size. I don't want to see it building on screen. What I want to do is get the whole thing laid out, and just bring the whole thing up as a single panel that just, boom, hits the screen. So that's got some changes in now. So with that said, let's go and put Hall into orbit. And hope I haven't made any goofs. So turn off the editor. And I actually have to separately move it around on my screen. Sorry about that. So what is this spacecraft? This, uh, uh, this is a exploratory mission called Justly Cluttered Hall. It's got 119 parts, and it cost me 38,000, 39,000, almost 40,000 funds to launch. Uh, I have been rescuing and uh, doing tourist missions like crazy. I'm at 1.7 million. I have upgraded most of the things on my base. Um, I will probably do another round of tourists and rescues before we actually go out to Mun. Because I'm not sure, but I think at that point your tourists start saying, I want to go orbit the moon! And that's more expensive to do. Uh, so here's Justly Cluttered Hall. Uh, I decided to use onion staging. I believe I have gone over onion staging in a video. If not, I will have to do so. But the short short of it is that we start off by firing all of our engines. Boom, 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 boom. Center, pair, pair, pair. And then we release our docking clamps. So as we are ascending, we are on seven engines, and we have a total thrust to weight ratio of 2.3, which is good. And that burns through, and we've got uh, between 486 and 622 meters per second, depending on altitude, of delta V before we flame out our first two engines because you notice these fuel ducts right here. This says that while we're burning, uh, any if there's fuel, you know, any fuel we expend from the center tank, there's actually another fuel duct down in here. So fuel in the center tank will be replenished from this tank. And if this tank here starts getting fuel down, it'll be replenished from here, which replenishes from here. The, the upshot of that is that when all seven of them are firing, only this tank and its cousin are, are getting fuel drawn from them. 
and when we have drawn all the fuel out of those two, those two engines will flame out and we will jettison those two. So we'll go from seven engines down to five, and the moment we do that, all five of those engines will have completely full fuel tanks. So with seven engines, we get basically 486 meters per second of delta V at 2.3. And then with five engines, we get 675 meters per second at 2.2. Okay. So by jettisoning the empty fuel tanks that were carrying the fuel that got us to where we are, we can improve our performance just slightly. And then we jettison those two and we're down to three engines and we've got another 1100 meters per second on those two stacks of fuel uh, at 1.99 and that gets us uh, bu 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 that, that should get us to where we are heading up for our Apogee. And then the Stage 4, when we're on Stage 4, it's just the one engine from the middle. So thrust to weight ratio is only 1.36, but we are well clear of the atmosphere and it's okay. Uh, we've got another, well, 1400 meters per second of delta V out of that engine, which is more than enough to circularize. So we should end up on orbit with still still stage four active, so we'll have the long pencil, and it will have some fraction of its fuel, probably less than half. And it will be in a circular orbit, and we will still have 2,761 meters per second of fuel uh, of delta V available for our top stage, which uses one of these FLT-800s, which just got unlocked. So even this top bit, um, from here upwards, this is the engine here, um, that has enough to do a lot of things. Um, 2,700 meters per second is a lot of delta V for us. So this is actually a fairly large rocket. It's larger than a rocket we would normally build to go to Mun or to go to Minmus. Uh, although for those missions we wouldn't be building it with this size. I have not yet opened up the larger rockets. We actually tried that uh, and it turned out that the large rockets, if you don't have RCS, it's a problem. And I couldn't do large rockets and RCS and fuel control, so I did fuel and RCS for this. We'll add up the we'll add in the large rockets after we've done a flyby of Mun and gotten some science. We need 90 science for that. Uh, we could probably do that flyby in this vessel, seriously. So anyway, let's go drop a save with this vessel in its uh, in its orbit. I am going to put a scientist on board. So what I want to do is I want to find the bottom scientist. Aldfred is going to get to go sit on on uh, orbit. It's the most junior member of the Corps. He gets to sit on orbit and wait for us to send up new software for him to test. And he's a scientist because there's a whole bunch of science experiments. At some point in my software testing, I may send him somewhere to collect science. And he's got some solar panels, so he doesn't run out of electricity. And I hope he's got a lot of snacks. Check staging. We've got the engines. We've got these. We have our first jettison, which is here, which is left and right. That's correct. We have our second jettison, which is here. That's correct. Third jettison is correct. And radial jettison, or coaxial jettison here, that's correct. And that starts the space engine, and eventually we will separate here. So if we gather science, we also need to pull the science into the uh, science container, which is kind of buried up in the nose of the spacecraft right there. Now, um, the other thing I wanted to set up was to establish some buttons to collect science. Uh, I could set up a single button that triggers all of the science and then I could just discard the science I don't want. So let's do that. So we're going to start off by opening the doors. And we're going to say custom button one. 
is, let's see, start off with him. So, oops, not reset. Conduct material study and observe mystery go. And now we need to get into the thermometer and the barometer. I have clipped them into place and it's terribly awkward. My thermometer go. Oh, there it is. Why can't I? There's the thermometer. So, too hot thermometer, log temperature. And then there's a barometer here, log pressure. Okay, there's button one. And button two is going to be on the storage unit. So one is run all the stuff and two is collect all the stuff. And then we're going to need to go EVA so we can restore these to functionality. I don't think we can fix these guys, can we? So reset goo canister, I'm not sure. Now, I don't think we can do that from an action group, so reset the canister is if you've observed it, but you haven't cleared it out. Uh, let's toggle the doors on zero. Okay, so one is gather science, two is pull it into the box, and ten is toggle the doors. Close doors. And now we're ready to go. And it has been 45 minutes, so we're going to take another 15 minutes to get our orbit and get saved. And I am going to do a really quick proof of concept to show a couple of tasks running before we end the stream. I did not save the ship configuration. So excuse me while I revert flight to vehicle assembly. Okay, so there's the GUI that showed up. And notice it dwelled there on the screen for a bit as we shifted away. Uh, check to make sure the action groups are set up. Yes, they are. And the crew is selected. Yes, he is. And I am going to save it in the Explore slot of the Explore folder. So the Explorer Justly Cluttered Hall is my development workhorse, and it's got Alfred and all of that. So launch. Uh, eventually, we will have choices of other launch pads. Yay! I wonder how, what we have to do to get those. Maybe I have to land at them. We'll find that out. I know. I could look it up. That's no fun. OK, so Justly Cluttered Hall is an automatic launch. So here is my my GUI that I, I created. So because we wrote all this code, and this is a repeatable launch, oh, here goes our onion staging, so the first two jettison and notice we're totally full of fuel on the other ones. So these show the total fuel available versus the total capacity of the tanks available. So the amount this is going down, these are all down by the same number of cubic meters of fuel. It's just that you know, this guy only can draw from the one tank, this guy can draw from two tanks, and this guy can draw from all five of them. So we're down to three engines, and we are at, well, we're halfway through the atmosphere here. We see this dial. I'm not, I'm not sure if this is actually linear in terms of pressure or not, but when this gets down past half its way, it's like, oh, yeah, we're halfway through the atmosphere. I'm cool with this. Uh, our altitude isn't that high, and our apoapsis is getting there.
and we are moving along fairly rapidly. We've been coming up at a, at a TWR of over two consistently. Uh, as we um, as we reach the end of each, just before we stage, our TWR will have gone up a bit. Uh, I can have more Delta V stats, so you notice our, our max TWR uh, on stage four will go from 1.3 to 2.17. That's about typical. Uh, most of our mass is fuel. And as we burn the fuel, we get a better acceleration out of it. So now we can see the pencil configuration that's going to be our bestest friend. We've got a whole lot of RCS fuel. We have the low thrust. There's actually two variants of the RCS jets. Uh, there's one that has one thrust and there's one that has one tenth of that. I wanted to use the fine thrust so that we had a better shot at doing the fine correction seated. And this does mean that when we are rotating like this and we turn on RCS, uh, RCS isn't going to swing us around really fast, but it will allow for fine correction. But that's fine with me. I could put a mixture of RCS jets in, if that was important. Also, wish there was a way of... Oops. Recenter the camera here. Wish there was a way of getting rid of these mount points. So when you, you use the separators and you eject, it leaves these little mount points left behind. Uh, yeah, ick. Okay, so there we go. Um, we have circularized. It was that fast. We have circularized at about 120 kilometers. And now we are headed for our selfie stick. So I chose this particular pose with the the pointy end going north and the, the hatch facing outward from the planet because this is a natural pose for a Kerbal in space. When I was doing the rescues, you know, and a Kerbal would uh, step off of his heap, his head tended to point planet north. So that's the direction I chose here. Uh, I am going to have to get better at maneuvering Kerbals around in space at some point. Um, I think it's just a simple left mouse click drag to, to reorient them. But Meanwhile, this is actually a, a fairly nice little pose. It's also, because it's not prograde or retrograde or directly in or directly out, uh, the only maneuver we would do from this pose would be an inclination change. And as long as I'm aware of inclination changes coming up, being in this pose tells me that I'm at this idle state where I'm waiting for a command. So uh, I've got my orbit. I have deleted all of the uh, trash from orbit, so it's all gone. We, the only debris we've got left is, the, is our own boosters, which are, you know, our debris is falling down here. Uh, the earlier stages we jettisoned are already gone, so this is our, our last one we, we jettisoned over here somewhere. So what can we do? We can circularize, we can execute a node, we can match inclination of something, we can plan an intercept, we can plan a correction, and then we've got course approach and fine approach. These are all cool things to do. They're all the various parts of the mission for doing a rescue. So uh, what do I want to do? Well, let's let's try just executing a node. Uh, I am going to set up a node that sends us into a larger orbit. So here I'm going to add maneuver. And I'm just going to yank this out until my apoapsis is a ways out. And yeah, 378. Let's let's shoot for 400 kilometers. Now we can go over here, and I can edit the maneuver. And I'm going to, oops, why is that doing that? Uh, 
Oh, haha. <laughs> yeah, I have my axes wrong. Okay, so these are all based on knowing what the icons look like, and sometimes I forget that this is radial in and radial out, and this is prograde and retrograde. So I want to burn more prograde to go out and more retrograde to come back in, and I want to do it on a very small scale. Just going to sneak up on 400 kilometers as close as I can get. So, yeah, I'm, I'm stuck. It's the smallest possible scale here, uh, I'm changing my apoapsis by 20 meters. Well, let's go to 10 meters above the apoapsis like that. Okay, so this is a burn of 174 meters per second. It's going to take nine seconds to burn. And uh, KOS is telling, or not KOS, KSP is telling us that we would start that burn in two minutes, 43 seconds. Well, I'm not going to do this by hand. I'm I'm no good at precision burns by hand. I can't hold my, my uh, forward vector on the little blue cross that, that closely, but I can reach up here to this task, this execute node. We light it up, and now we're inside the maneuver execute code, and I can drink a little bit of coffee. Now, we're not going to execute the node perfectly. There you hear the RCS tripping off as we try to get ourselves properly aligned with the maneuver node. And I've got logic in there as a background task that enables RCS when our facing is different from our steering by enough or when our angular rate is high enough. So if we're swinging around rapidly, we want RCS to slow ourselves down. If we're a long ways away from where we want to go, we want RCS so we can get there. And we assume that if we're moving slowly and within distance, we assume that we have enough reaction wheel to do it. Now that got us pretty close to where we wanted to go. It did overshoot. And just the process of rotating ourselves back around is changing where KSP thinks our orbit is. So back on selfie stick, it looks like uh, we were going to head to 10, so it looks like we overshot by about 50 meters. That's okay. 50 meters in 40 kilometers, 400 kilometers. I'll take that. So now I'm going to want to circularize out there. Well, if I hit circ, it's going to circularize where I am. So I want to go out to the apoapsis. And I think what I'm going to do is set up a alarm. The Kerbal alarm clock is now built into KSP. Woohoo! Woohoo! So I don't think I loaded that as an add-on. Um, so clicking on that little thing gave us this apoapsis mark here. So I am going to warp to next. OK, so we hit that alarm. And I'm going to delete and close like that. Now, I'm going to want to monitor my fuel if we do too much maneuvering when we are in, you know, if we're in the shadow, okay, so there's, there's the sun. If we do too much maneuvering when we're here, we can run out of electric charge. Uh, it, you, you have to try pretty hard on, on this one, but it can be done. But let's go ahead and circularize. We'll, we are currently at, uh, if I circularize here, it's going to continually be changing our, our orbit to try to circularize wherever we happen to be. And we're going to coast up a little bit. We're going to float up and down a little bit while we're doing this. So you'll notice that we are very near apoapsis, and it managed to circularize right as we hit apoapsis. Oh, that is beautiful. Four, 400 kilometers plus 60 meters. And of course, this is measuring the altitude of our control node, not our center of mass. 
So as we rotate this around, if we were pointed out, it would claim we have a larger radius than we do. So uh, tip for the wise, your radius vector is not your center of mass for orbit's sake. Seems to me that we would want our control node to be based on our position at our center of mass, which is the thing that goes into orbit. Um, it is quite possible that when we go on rails, it will be computing the orbit of the capsule. So it would, it might be looking at the position of the capsule rather than the position of center of mass. And that would be unfortunate, but it would be consistent. If it's doing it based on the position of our center of mass, then the values I would calculate based on my position vector are going to be wrong based on the location of center of mass versus the location of me, which means that if I want that to be correct, if I ever get to that precision where the distance between center of mass and the control node is significant, I'm going to have to have some way of retrieving that vector. So I would need the position of my center of mass relative to my control node. And the ship position gives us position of, of the control node relative to the control node. So position of center of mass, do I have to iterate through all the parts, adding them up to find my, my current uh, center of gravity? I don't know. Anyway, so there it is. Let's set this uh, let's do a save game. And this is going to be a, uh, a hull on orbit at 4400 km. Boom. So what happens just for fun? We're just over an hour here. I probably should call it a stream, but I've got to try something. Minmus is my target. Minmus is an inclined orbit. So to get to Minmus, I need to uh, fix my orbital inclination and I need to do an intercept. Or do I? What if I just plan an intercept? How good can it get? Well, the first thing I'm noticing is that uh, <clears throat> my orbital intercept to get to Minmus uh, intersects Mun. <laughs> Lordy. Um, I haven't planned on that. Um, And apparently, I escaped from Kerbin at that point. So yeah, we try to intercept Mun, and the first thing that happens is we actually slingshot past, uh, well, try to intercept Minmus. We slingshot past Mun and head out. So let's um, cancel that. And I am going to, I'm going to wait for a few orbits here. Uh, I'm going to wait until the angle between Minmus and Mun is more off to the side. There we go. Okay, so with that set, plan an intercept. Okay, so this is the intercept that it plans for me. Uh, it's not really close because of the inclination of the orbit, but we do get a Minmus encounter here. And over at Minmus, so here's the encounter we get with Minmus. We enter its SOI at far south and kind of fly by it at a very far distance, and then we escape. And Minmus will have pulled on us a little bit and As a result, it will have slowed us down a little bit in our orbit. I'm, I'm seeing that it slows us down. Um, and we get a MUN encounter on the way back. <laughs> OK, so MUN is a navigational hazard on the way to Minmus. But let's, let's go ahead and do this burn. This is a 750 meter per second burn. We have 
383 meters per second left in our current stage and 2700. So in the middle of this burn, we are going to stage. So let's execute the node. So that's something I need to look at in my um, in my transfer setup. Um, I need to consider that if my transfer is going into the SOI of something other than my current body or my target body, that maybe I should try a different time. So we are time warping at almost our maximum rate here at 10,000. Uh, and we are trying to run out the clock. There we go. And now here we go with our get our burn set up here. We're going to be pointed at uh, 090, basically levels. So this is almost prograde, very close to our prograde vector. Oh, let's take a look at our, our maneuver node here. What is this maneuver we're doing? This is a completely programmed maneuver, so my, my intercept planner constrains itself to burning only actually exactly prograde at this stage, because everything else will handle in a correction burn. Okay, you saw the orbits jump around there a bit. Uh, it's going to flicker around as it tries to draw our stages of the orbit that are perturbed by MUN. So in theory from here, if we just let it rip, we would have a flyby of Minmus and a flyby of MUN just for funsies. And when it's all done, we would then have an orbit that brought us all the way back to doing a re-entry. So in theory, we, need, we, we could just do nothing at this point, gather science along the way and land and we're done. But I'm going to do one better. Uh, I want to go out to the middle here somewhere and plan a correction orbit. Um, the correction task doesn't use the old correction logic exactly. Um, for the rescue, I always did the correction at half time. For this correction task, I always do the correction uh, 60 seconds ahead of where we are. So I'm going to want to uh, warp out to about here. Actually, let's 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 do this sooner. We have a a big change of plane an inclination change that we, we need to make up for. We're not going to do a plane change, um, but what we will do is do a plan correction, which should sneak that back up. So we'll fly by Minmus on an angle. Oh, and look at that. It just smacked us right in there, and look at what happens. If we focus on Minmus, Here's our old flyby. So Minmus will be going to the left at that point. We, we were down below. And now we're here and we enter from the left and basically impact Minmus and switch out. And where we exit is going to depend on what maneuvers we do. So execute that node. Oops, plan should be executing the node. Three, two, one. 
There we go. And after the burn, you saw that we had enough precision to nail that right on. So I'm going to go to the alarm clock. We're going to actually go take a look at this. I need to head out. But we're going to create an alarm for SOI change. I do want to see what this looks like when we get here. We're still focusing our view on Minmus. So relative to Minmus, here we come. There we go, delete and close. That easy. And we're at Minmus and we still have almost 2400 Delta V left. So our research rocket, our development rocket, is more than enough to, to wander around this system. As uh, long as we load it up each time from its initial 400 kilometer uh, ready orbit, uh, we should be able to basically have fun in the local Kerbal SOI. Getting out to these outer planets, uh, that's, a, that's a later thing. So I'm going to call it here. Uh, we will come back when I've got a few more things ready to go. Uh, I think our, our next step is either going to be starting to put up some satellites to get a, uh, a network going. Because you notice I've got no signal out here. Ah, we have transferred SOI. We're now officially in orbit around Minmus. Um, notice I have no, no actual connection. Uh, I still have a connection to the archive because we're using that, but it might be a good idea to put up satellites to have that connection so I can um, send science back. Anyway, that's our next thing. So either science, uh, satellites, or fly by a not sure which. We'll see you.